Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Apollo's Odyssey. I'm your host, Apollo Asteria, and tonight I have a very special guest lined up for you all. Um, I'm waiting for her to come on right now, so hopefully she gets on here. But uh, Carrie Cassidy, she has an interview style which I think is truly incredible, and she has done so much work in regards to bringing forward whistleblowers in the disclosure community for over 20 years now, I believe it is. So I am very excited to interview her. I just love her style and she really gets in there and gets the truth out of people. And I am truly inspired by her work. Um, so tonight we will be discussing the legacy of Project Camelot and of course, and then also her book, The Rebel Gene. I have not been able to read the rebel gene book yet i have been waiting to read it but i have like this huge line of books that <laughs> i have lined up every time i go somewhere when i'm traveling i buy like five books and then i somehow just collect all these books and uh, i try to read everything in order from when i get it so i was hoping to get it done before i had her on the show but the topic is actually something i'm very interested in because i've done some research with a uh, Garrett John Laporto's work, which I talked about on another show recently. And um, his work is really fascinating because he talks about the way seers and how there's this certain DNA type that's like a morph DNA gene. So I want to get her side of that and, you know, what she thinks of that and how that compares to her book. Um, so it looks like she's in the studio now. So I'm about to bring her on. But before I do, please go to shamanspears.com and check out my new products. Uh, of course, I have the latest collection of Shaman Spears. Let me uh, share this here. So I actually rebranded my logo. I'm really stoked about it. I made this uh, yesterday. And obviously I have the new collection of Shaman Spears, which are uniquely handcrafted energy channeling devices. My latest collection is the Odyssey collection. All spears have copper coils, crystals, magnets, and sand. I collect from sacred places around the world, down the insides, and I charge them all onto an energetic collective where each new one that I make makes the whole collective stronger. And each person who has a spear and channels energy into their spear also charges the entire collective. But besides that, I also have some new shirts. So let me stop sharing that in here. So here's my new shirts. They are I Believe in Humans, and they promote the show, Paul's Odyssey. They actually have my Paul's Odyssey logo on it. And I'm really excited to have these up on the site because it's my first uh, kind of Paul's Odyssey promotional material. So check that out. I'm really stoked about that. And uh, I only, so far I have 10 of each size, small, medium, and large. So please go ahead and look into that at shamanspears.com. All right, let's uh, bring Carrie on here. Or, uh, looks like she's, oh, okay, there we are. Hi. Hey, it's so good to see you. How are you doing? Hi, I'm, I'm good. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, Nice to see you. <laughs> Sorry, just getting yeah. I, I've been telling the audience here that your style is just so incredible and it's really inspired me. And it was so great meeting you with Brad Olson earlier in the year. And uh, I've been watching your show ever since. I'm surprised I hadn't actually seen it, you know, before we had met. I'd heard about you for a while, but your style is just like, you really go in there and get the truth out of people. And I think your interview style is probably by far my favorite interview style that I've seen out of anyone. So, so much respect to you. <laughs> You're like, I, I was like telling everyone on my Facebook Live earlier that I really feel like, the, like the beginning of your show, you have the uh, cheetah for Project Camelot, the cheetah like running around. And I feel like that's totally like your energy. Like you just go in there and just like, rah, like get the truth. And it's like really badass. I really like it. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that. So you've done a lot of work with Bring Forward Whistleblowers over, it's been over 20 years, right? Uh, well, I, I've been doing this for about 17 years now. So uh, actually, it, you know, if you want to be more exact, but uh, so. 
Amazing. Um, so I want to get into your Rebel Gene book, and that's kind of like what I sort of theme the show on tonight. Um, okay. But before we get into that, uh, is there anything, you know, I, I'd like to hear more about, you know, the whistleblowers you have brought forward over the past um, years. I, I know you brought forward some whistleblowers that were, they came to you before anyone else. Would you like to get into um, some of these individuals and, you know, anything about your show that you would like to share with the audience? Uh, well, I mean, I have key whistleblowers that brought through the, the truth, uh, having worked in black projects for the secret space program for, uh, in, in many cases, most of their lives. So those whistleblowers, some of which were already out on the circuit, as we call it, uh, talking, but for some reason when Project Camelot, when, when I interviewed them, it really, I don't know, kind of blew up and, and went viral, if you will. Um, so I, I've been doing that. Uh, the thing is that I can name certain ones. Uh, some of them, most of them went on to continue to do lots of different interviews. Um, you know, William Tompkins, for example, has been interviewed on Gaia TV and, you know, Mike Asala and other people have interviewed him. Uh, but when I interview somebody, it's, it's considered to be quite um, unique because of the way I do interviews. Uh, you know, I, I tend to follow a through line in my question questioning. So I don't just let things drop. I, I actually follow out what the person says and then try to link things together in such a way that makes sense for the audience as well. So that if a person that I'm talking to starts to which a lot of times they do, like they'll start deviating from the point or they'll, they'll start obfuscating or, or trying to distract you from what they just said type of thing. A lot of these kind of techniques because when you're interviewing a whistleblower, they have a, a drive to keep things uh, secret to a certain extent. So they've signed a, a non-disclosure agreement uh, their lives and the lives of their family and friends could be at risk. So there's good reason why they would want to uh, be careful when being interviewed. But there's also the element of mind control. So the longer you work for the government, obviously, the you know, the, the deep state, really, the, the, the bigger amount of programming there is to get through. So that's another thing that we have to deal with is and, and so again, my technique is to, because I listen carefully and I also follow it out through whatever they're saying and their story, um, most, lots of interviews viewers won't do that. What they'll do is the person will say something. And then if the person says another statement that doesn't necessarily connect, but changes the subject, they'll just allow them to go down a different road. But I don't, so much let that happen. I like to make sure they stay to the point until we change for, you know, some given reason. So, so again, that's kind of my style. And one of the, you know, whistleblowers, uh, Pete Peterson, uh, and he was a physicist and a um, really kind of like a doctor who, whatever you want to call him, he, he worked in black projects for over 40 years when we interviewed him. And in that case, I interviewed him, David Wilcock interviewed him and Bill Ryan interviewed him. We spent the whole weekend sitting, talking, listening to him talk. And then all of a sudden on the last day we were there, we were there for like three or four days. He said, okay, now you can turn on your cameras. So then each of us got a chance to interview him. And what happened was, of course, they went along with their interviews and everything was fine and dandy. But then when it got to me, I start asking him certain kinds of questions and he starts answering, well, if I answer you, I'd have to kill you. You know, so he kept having to say that. And then ultimately my portion of the interview became this um, issue for him so that the Pentagon and him tried to convince us when we're releasing the interview to get, to get rid of my portion, 
Well, the reason is because by the time you get to me, I'm really sort of um, holding his feet to the fire. I don't know what you want to call that. Um, and so it's, it's very obvious that I ask more direct questions, again, following the through line and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, but as far as interviewers, interviewees that I've, I've dealt with, I mean, the whistleblowers in Camelot are quite famous, a lot of them by now. Uh, so, you know, if you start at the very beginning, uh, I guess you could say that Mr. X, that's what we called him. And, and he died unexpectedly over a Christmas when, um, and so I believe that he was killed very sadly. Um, and then there, there was Henry Deacon. He, he actually came out a number of times and I also interviewed him on stage eventually. But when he first came to Camelot, he wouldn't even actually had a recording, this uh, device that he put onto the table with us that would block out any, uh, so that what he was set, saying could not be picked up by uh, surveillance technology at the time. Uh, and then eventually he did come out under his own name and he actually spoke at a conference of mine. I flew him in from, from where he was into the conference and he spoke. But then he, did, he eventually, he spoke at a conference in, or tried to in Barcelona, they actually made him leave the stage, but he did get a chance to say some things about living, about move, um, going to Mars uh, to work on and off and going through, a, he called it a jump room, uh, or at least that's what we interpreted it as. Um, and this is before like anyone was really coming out about the secret space program? Oh yeah, this, all of our witnesses, I mean, we're talking about going back to 2000, six, uh, 2007, and so on. And a lot of these other people started following, basically copying Camelot, you know, doing what I do. Um, we were really one of the first out there in terms of, not to say that we were the only ones because they were researchers, you know, talking to these people, writing books. Uh, Stephen Greer, in fact, a couple of years earlier had tried to do, um, this disclosure book and he filmed it, but he wouldn't release his film because he was standing on ceremony. And I was um, coming from the point of view of, a, of being more, I, I lived and worked in Hollywood before I got into Camelot. So I was about um, sort of the MTV guerrilla filmmaking, uh, you know, just go out with a camera and, and one or two people and, and, and get what you can get. Uh, so that was really my style that was very different than the norm. So that's why we ended up being sort of a, a very unusual situation. And, and we hit the ground running. Uh, we got a huge you know, following on YouTube right from the get-go because everyone started to see that we were doing something no one else did. We, tr we tur were touring the world you know, on just a very cheap budget, but I had a small inheritance from my mother. Um, it allowed us to to fly to countries and interview whistleblowers in person. And most people were not doing that sort of thing. And especially internationally, um, you know, like we're one of the few people who have interviewed ben Benjamin Fulford in person, you know, um, and, and so many others. And, and, you know, Robert O'Dean, Bob Dean is one of our very famous whistleblowers. Um, there's a lot of them, uh, you know, John Lear is, is very famous, but John was already, you know, even John and Bob were both doing interviews, Clifford Stone. These people were being interviewed, but they were never interviewed the way I did it. Okay, that's what changed everything. And because I knew there was a through line that led to the secret space program, to exposing the secret space program and everything that went on in it, and the revealing of the various ET races and, and so on. In fact, even to this day, that's how I, how I do my interviews. So I see the big picture. I, I don't know why, I just came in on, onto the planet. I knew and understood the big picture very early on in my life when I was quite young. So when I got into Camelot, I wasn't coming in as someone naive that didn't know anything. In fact, people have said to me, you know, what did you hear that surprised you the most or something? And the funny thing is, and, and we also shot a television show um, 
we were supposed to be the follow-up show to Jesse Ventura's conspiracy theory. And we shot um, this, this main uh, pilot show and then the CIA tried to take it over and, and they shelved it. But at any rate, it did show on TV, um, on True TV w one night, but we, and we have a copy of it. It's on the internet, it's on my, my channel. But so what happened was they kept saying, show surprise, show surprise. And we're like, but we're not surprised. We understand <laughs> this, we know this, we, this is, you know, and, and, and that was the thing is that, in fact, they even got a, 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 a sort of a close up of me at one point, like with my mouth open and that they were saying, oh, great. So they grabbed that piece, like that frame, and they put it in a completely different part of the show. And that was what they were trying to show me looking surprised, but I wasn't being surprised. Actually, that was caught of me off when I was off camera, the cameras weren't supposed to be running. And I, David Wilcock had just said something to me that surprised me because I'm not going to get into it, but it had nothing to do with being surprised about the information. That's all I can tell you. So it's, it's just funny how life works. So at any rate, I, I hope I'm answering your question. You know, that that's what's a, uh... I, I've noticed that with women in the industry, they always want to make us out like, you know, kind of a seen and not heard kind of thing. Like I've experienced this myself and I'm not going to get into names and people I've dealt with, but it's like, like what you were saying about getting the take of like the surprise expression. It's like, they just want to get the women interviewers. They just want to kind of get them nodding and, you know, making facial expressions and that's it. And it's like, no, I have stuff I want to say and I, I'm going to say it. So, you know, I, and what you were saying about your interview style and following this line of truth, I've definitely noticed that with you in all of your interviews. And I think it's really incredible. And meeting you in person, I can tell you're just so intuitive and perceptive. I mean, you said some things to me that, you know, brought up things that, you know, I, I actually, so one thing in particular, um, you brought up something in an interview you did with me about um, what, what places in Egypt kind of stood out the most to me. And um, I mentioned some certain places. And right after this, Jean-Claude had me on his show talking about sacred sexuality and priestess hoods. And then I, uh, it was like every book I picked up after that. And, and this always happened to me my whole life. Like every time I pick up a book, it's always like the next kind of information I need to have for some reason. And yeah. um, it was like every single book I picked up had to do with um, a priestess, like in, in a, a group of like priestesses in like ancient times. And then I started getting into Joan Grant and like all this stuff started coming up and I realized this like connection with it and like the people that started coming into my life were like people that I feel I must have um, done this sort of work with in different time periods. So it was really fascinating. Um, but yeah, like your, your interview style and, you know, and so also I wanted to say a comment earlier about, um, what you were saying about being the first person in the field, kind of coming out with like interviews about with secret space program whistleblowers and then other interviewers kind of researchers coming forward with this information later, like, you know, like shows like Gaia and I mean, you didn't mention Gaia, but you know, like shows like that. I'm wondering if like what your thoughts are on, you know, how legit um, or how credible the people are that have been brought forward um, since then, like since you started bringing people forward, like, do you think that there has been a lot of um, people that have been brought forward in the community that are kind of like disinformation agents or how do you feel about it? Because, you know, I, I've been analyzing it over the past years and it's definitely very confusing these past few years um, with our, you know all the drama and the weird stuff happening in the disclosure community, and it makes me sad because um, it kind of discredits everyone when this is happening. So I'm going to know what your thoughts are on that. Well, sure. Uh, I, I can say that I think that for whatever reason, Project Camelot sort of hit the scene at a time uh, using video uh, because there had been people like Paula Harris and Linda Mullen Howe who were they were journalists, but they were doing writing, you know, so they're writing articles and such. They weren't using the camera. Uh, I was a filmmaker. I, you know, had, again, the background in Hollywood that that differentiated us. 
So, and then again, as I said, the guerrilla filmmaking aspect and the avant sort of avant-garde approach, you know, very informal in your face. Cause the first, you know, I'd always put the camera right in their face and it, the two hour interviews also, that's another thing. It wasn't sound bites. We didn't edit out what they said. We basically put everything they said on, on the, you know, on the record. So, but um, yeah, I mean, I can say that because we got most of the best testimony and even now I'd say Captain Mark Richards is one of the best whistleblowers to ever hit the scene as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm the only journal journalist that's interviewed him. I mean, <laughs> there's another journalist in, in San Francisco who about a year or two ago, about probably two years, maybe over two years ago, interviewed him briefly, but he interviewed him all about his time in Vietnam. And it was like sound bites and interrupted constantly. And so he says, I mean, here's this amazing secret space captain, you know, of a Starship Enterprise type, you know, craft who's gone interstellar. And this guy is only talking to him about, you know, him being a, a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, which of course he was in the early days, but that's just like what, not what he was about. So um, what I would say is that, uh, yes, I, I think there are, um, it's almost like after Camelot and a lot of our whistleblowers, there's a, you know, it's kind of like a lighter version, a diet version, or <laughs> whatever you want to call it, of a whistleblower. No offense to some of those people out there. I mean, I think these people, you know, a lot of times they have stories, but they haven't really uncovered the truth. See, there's a difference between having, let's say, um, you know, uh, being, you know, reverse aged or reverse, uh, you know, 20 years and back and all those, those programs. There's a difference between that memory and the memory of somebody like a Pete Peterson or Mark Richards or other people who actually remember it consciously, who actually never really lost their memory. That doesn't mean that they didn't encounter uh, probably some efforts to mind control them to some degree. But a lot of these people were in it for like, as I say, 40 years, and they were they were in it full time, you know, their life. So that's that kind of is comes those guys come before, you know, the ones that are are, are sort of coming forward, um, I guess you would say more recently. But there's also um, there was also a clamp down. So when Snowden and um, Julian Assange were brought to the scene and then basically um, thrown in jail, clamped down and all that stuff, um, that was that was basically, you know, those were like I mean, it's not like it didn't really happen. It really happened. But they were used as examples by the deep state to say, if you talk, this is what's going to happen to you. So after that, we've had almost no real solid whistleblowers. Um, there are some people disclosing information. A lot of times they're what I call a limited hangout. Um, so you have to be, you have to be very discerning in, in what you're listening to. And um, there's also, um, how can I say it? There's a, um, there's, there's sort of a, a whitewashing, if you will, and a, and a compartmentalization that happens to where you'll get a small fragment. You know, I've interviewed tons of people that have experiences and I'm, I wouldn't say that those are not true. Okay. But a lot of times they don't know where they, they don't know how they come into the story. They don't know how they, what they're, you know, they don't understand. They, it's very hard in those cases to follow a through line. I'm, I'm being careful because I don't want to name names, but some people even thinking that they were on Mars, but there's sort of um, caveats to that. There's caveats to those kinds of memories. Some can be screen memories, obviously. Some can be, um, yeah, they did do time travel, but they didn't actually go to Mars. They went like from one part of the earth to another part. And I have done some investigation of some of the testimonies in that way. What do you and mean screen memories? Oh, well, screen memories are really obvious. Those are what the grays give you so you don't remember you being abducted. I mean, the screen memories are very common where it could be anything. You just don't remember, but you've got something in its place, you know, that you think you like, oh, last night I had a dream, you know, um, 
I don't know, I went on, well, just a simple, you know, I went on a helicopter and, you know, we went and landed in such and such a place and so on. And maybe it's an abduction dream and maybe you actually went in a UFO somewhere. So a screen memory will be something that is, is interspersed in between your memory, your real memory and, and what you are talking about to the public. It's, it's basically just a screen memory. <laughs> you know, it's the screen. It's, it's what's in, in between. So there's a lot of that, a lot of screen memory, uh, people that are relying on screen memory more, even sort of taking some of the bits and pieces that they do remember, fusing them into a more coherent story when the story really isn't coherent and so on. So it's a very complex story. Um, I think also, what I've noticed lately is a lot of, um, what, what should we say? It's funny because when the story first comes out, it's quite raw, right? And it, you can tell a testimony when you're hearing an interview, when the person is really, if you get in there deep enough, where they're experiencing it. I mean, I've had people burst into tears that I'm interviewing, okay? In other words, they're having, they're having a real experience with me as an interviewer. And um, because they're talking about their experiences, they start to relive them, okay? So it becomes very vibrant and very powerful. Do you think and there's something about you that you're able to bring that out of them somehow, like energetically? Oh yeah, you know, um, I'm not gonna say the guy's name, but there's a guy out there who is quite perceptive and has had lots of experiences in the deep state. and talks about um, underground bases, I think I can say that. And he, he was, you know, I invited him to be interviewed by me, but he said, no, she gets people to reveal things they're not supposed to reveal. And, and, and I've been told that. So I don't, it's not like I'm, tr I'm not forcing anybody. I just ask a good question at a, at a strategic time, if you will. I know how, I, I know when I'm getting, um, you know, what I say, screen memories. I know when I'm getting uh, programmed, somebody programmed. I know because I can tell by their speech pattern, for one thing, you can just tell that they're, they're flowing too easily. You know, they're not thinking while they're talking. They're just, it's just coming out. They've said that this, like whatever story so many times and nobody thought to ask them. And then I'll ask them a question that throws the whole house of cards off and, and they'll get discombobulated. And some of them will get angry. In fact, I, I recently interviewed a guy who I believe has um, some screen memories and, and interference. And, and every time I asked him a question, he just lost it. He just really couldn't handle it. And then towards the end, when I, I was asking him, and so consequently I asked him very few questions, but towards the end, you know, I was basically getting a little impatient and basically decided, you know, fuck it, I'm gonna ask this, this guy some, you know, hard hitting questions. And he kind of like um, started, he just lost his temper and started insulting me right on camera. I mean, this is what happens. You get a real response from somebody who is not used to being asked the real, you know, to put the real thing out there. So. And my point of view of all this is that there it's twofold. Okay, one, you have a whistleblower. Now a whistleblower is somebody who is a soul who has chosen to work on the dark side for a certain amount of time and then come over to the light to reveal and to serve humanity. Okay, so my job is like to- Like a character help, arc. Yeah, help them, help them, you know, serve humanity and make sure that they do. And then the other thing is also, you know, that basically um, I, I, you know, I serve the people. So I don't want to have a person that come and talk to me that's going to lie to me constantly. You know, I let some lies go. I, I let some, you know, what I don't delve into every little sentence anyone says. But, you know, for the main points, a lot of times if I, if I have a person who I think is lying, Sometimes they're lying consciously and sometimes they have no idea they're lying. They just don't know. And so I will ask them questions that jar them on purpose or I'll interrupt them and ask them a question. Cause what happens is they just, they, they're, they get all discombobulated. They get, you know, and that throws them, it breaks through the programming. And so then I'll get in, 
answers really quickly, like all of a sudden from the person who had no, in other words, they weren't able to stop themselves before they spoke. And uh, one of the people that, for example, then there's another kind, like, which is uh, like um, William Tompkins, who is what you call a loose cannon. He was very in touch with his Pleiadian handlers, let's say. And when he talked to me, we got a Pleiadian connection going on a, on a, what you call, you know, a telepathic level. And I, I know sometimes when that happens with someone I'm interviewing. And so that meant, what that means is that I've already gotten underneath his defenses. Okay. That I'm already in touch with what he's in touch with and that we're going to really communicate very well. But that's the last thing that the powers that be want to see happen. Right. So then he ended up saying things he wasn't supposed to, you know, after all it, being interviewed by so many people for hours and hours and getting paid tons of money to do so. And, you know, I come along and in three hours, I, I like, it's an incredible interview. So if you haven't seen it, I hi highly recommend it. I definitely need to go and check that out. I, I definitely want to go back and check out your earlier work. Is that all on Project Camelot? Um, on your, it's on all, your I mean, my YouTube channel was uh, of 16 years, uh, was taken down in March of um, this year, 2021, because uh, uh, they basically didn't don't like anything you said about COVID, right? So they've never, I never used to have a problem with them because what happened was they couldn't have a problem with my ET, you know, secrets based stuff. Because if they gave it credibility, and gave me a strike over it, then that tended to mean it's real. It's in, you know, but they never wanted to act like it was real. So I got under the radar for many, many years. But when I started to get into um, interviewing, you know, in the last year and a half, interviewing doctors about COVID and really delving into the COVID story and doing tons of investigation on it and stuff. More and more, I had to play a cat and mouse game with YouTube who tried to censor me constantly. So that's what happened. They, there was finally an interview in which <laughs> Robert Davis Seal, even though the interview was about his tour, he said one sentence in the entire interview about COVID saying it was fake or something like that. And we weren't even talking about that, but he just brought it up or I don't can't re even remember how it happened. But th and then and they gave they I, and I even had been uh, I made this that video enlisted, which means that it wasn't public because I had a premonition the night before they took me down that that might be the interview that would be the coup de grace that they would take down my whole channel over. And sure enough, uh, that's what happened. So, but I moved it to being what's called unlisted thinking because unlisted means it's not public, means that you, that I don't make public necessarily the URL because you can't find it anymore on YouTube. It's hidden. Okay. But they gave me a strike anyway. And that was my third strike. And then I was deleted. So wow. um, in answer to your question. So yes, um, you know, everything's on odyssey.com now. Um, most of all my interviews, although there's some from the last year uh, that that were hidden on YouTube. See, what Odyssey did was I signed up for Odyssey and forgot about it. And what they did was this wonderful service to many of us. And they they basically sucked up my entire channel with everything, descriptions, you name it, titles. And they brought all the videos into my Odyssey channel. All I had to do was claim it and then it was mine. But what, because that whole year I had been hiding videos and making them unlisted and publishing on my, on my website only, the link, um, those unlisted videos did not get sucked up into Odyssey. So we do have some missing videos. It's not um, tons, but it's some. And we're, we're actually, you know, in the process of finding them and getting them up there you know, um, so, and we're getting closer and closer to, to getting that happen, happening, but it's, it's actually taken several months to not only do that, but we've also, we have a members only area that the most recent videos from the last year are going to be for mem members and then all of the library up, up until May of 2020. In May of 2020, this is a year before they deleted my channel, they demonetized me. 
So in May of 2020, sent every video since then, I couldn't make any money on advertising. So that's when we went to a subscriber base. And now we charge $3 a month, less than the price of a latte, um, for uh, to, do, to view um, all of our videos, which is the newest ones as well. But the all the all the ones prior to to May of 2020 are free on Odyssey. So if you understand, awesome. Yeah, I, you know a lot. This has been happening to so many people lately. I know Laura Eisenhower's channel just was taken down, and I mean pretty much everyone I know that has shows this has happened to them. But it, it's interesting because it's you know like you were saying, it's like everyone's kind of getting their own platforms, and you know these subscription based platforms. It's really not that much to pay, you know, like you said, it's like the price of a latte, you pay for all these people to continue with their careers and bring out their information. And yeah. it's kind of like boycotting, you know, like YouTube and Facebook and these platforms. It's like, if everyone starts moving these other platforms and starts boycotting the major platforms, they're gonna really um, be kicking themselves in the ass, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I hope that they're gonna be prosecuted ultimately for because there's, you know, I'm also, um, I'm a credentialed journalist. So they violated not only my personal YouTube channel and personal rights of, of freedom of speech, but they violated freedom of the press in my case, like legitimately freedom of the press. And so in that case, they should really, you know, that's a violation of our laws here in, in the United States. And that's just, that you just can't do that. You know, they can't do that. They can't get away with it. So um, I know we're kind of like waiting forever to see this stuff uh, hit the fan, so to speak, but I'm still hopeful that uh, that Trump and his team and, and Juan Osavin and the, and the rest will uh, prevail. Yeah. I, I hear he's been creating his own platform or he's been working on it. And I know, so this is interesting uh, here in LA. Um, I'm not going to mention exactly who, but right after I was kind of doing a lot in regards to the uh, Trump rallies back in uh, back in January and before that, leading up to the election or after the election, um, it, it was interesting because someone that's close to me in the entertainment industry that I work with, I don't want to exactly give the label because I don't want to expose them, but they came forward and said, Hey, Paula, I just want you to know that I've been seeing everything you're doing. And I got really worried. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, is this going to be a problem? And he told me that basically he'd been a conservative, you know, here in Hollywood and he feels like he has to hide it. And he's someone that's, you know, kind of does important things in the entertainment industry in regards to like working with me and everything. And I, di I didn't know this. And, and I was like, dude, I'm, I'm so lucky I ended up working with you. And um, so it was really interesting because he came forward and he told me he basically has to hide it. And it's interesting because it's like the people in Hollywood who don't uh, talk, they're the ones that you can tell are the ones that are not really quite with the main program. And there aren't many of them, but there's some of them there. So it's definitely really yeah. fascinating to see that happen. And, you know, so he was discussing with me that there's like this whole entire audience of, and I, I don't necessarily consider myself like conservative. Like, I, I mean, I kind of do, but you know, I'm, I'm just really like not for the deep state, <laughs> obviously. And I'm definitely not a liberal in the term, the way that it is now, um, or the way that people describe it as now, I guess you would say. But um, it's interesting because he was saying it's like Hollywood, like the entertainment industry, it's like they promote everything to an audience that is missing. They're missing like over like millions and millions of viewers that they could be really kind of gearing their information, everything to like the a whole conservative community in the United States, which is probably really over half the country. So I think it's really fascinating. I think a lot of people are starting to see that and they're going to start bringing um for these new platforms if it doesn't all get censored, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, I mean, I I have um, high hopes about everything changing. I mean, I think this whole situation with, uh, you know, COVID, the whole house of cards is, is actually falling down. Um, and I think the these crimes against humanity are going to be exposed. And these players that have been 
leading the charge, so to speak, to uh, basically enslave the human race and link us all to what I consider the Borg and, and, and AI uh, run by communist China or affiliated with communist Chinese. And uh, basically link us all through the nano in uh, the vaccines in COVID and, and also in the tests. It's all, it's all part of a, a plot to take over humanity. And it's actually an alien AI, an alien plot that is backed by humans. So in this case, um, I think that all of it's getting exposed and I think it's going to continue to be exposed. I think there will be I mean, I know that certain players now are even saying we could have a global civil war, if you want to call it that, um, basically with countries rebelling and understanding that they've been had, understanding that this is a population elimination uh, program. And oh, I just want to make a disclaimer here. In no way are we promoting violence in saying this. Well, no, I'm just saying that these people will be prosecuted in a Nuremberg kind of trial. That's not mm -hmm. violence. That's just justice, you know, uh, through legal, a legal program. So that's, you know, that's what I'm talking about. So, you know, that's the violence has already been done. The violence is when you when you basically stick someone against their will with a needle and you know what's in it. You know that it's it's got you're lying to them about the contents. You know, they've even opened the packages of. They're not telling you the ingredients. I mean, this is violence in my view. I agree. I agree. And, you know, it's, it's been really, they've really been exposing themselves over the past year. And this kind of leads me into the main uh, topic of tonight's show, which is the rebel gene. And I really wanted to get into this with you what exactly is the rebel gene and the people who carry this rebel gene and the leaps of faith they have taken um, in regards to like pioneering these kinds of movements and uprisings throughout humanity. Um, so I'd like to hear your take on what exactly the rebel gene is and what your book is about. Well, thank you. Yes, uh, the rebel gene is, is basically a reference to the Enki Enlil story. Um, and you know involves Anu and the on what's called the Anunnaki and written about in the Zachariah Sitchin books uh, and the translation of the Sumerian tablets. So in that in those tablets is a story about two brothers Enki and Enlil, and the idea um, the idea there being that Enki was supposedly in charge of Africa and he was more interested in um, humans having a certain amount of freedom. He also got involved in genetic engineering of the human race, re-engineering really. And then there was Enlil and Enlil was much more um, sort of restrictive, I guess totalitarian in his rule and he was involved in the Middle East. And so the, the individuals that were under Enlil in the Middle East tended to be taught to be more um, what, what's called administrators. In other words, there you could think of them in these terms of middle managers doing what they're told, getting other people to do what they're told. You know, kind of those kinds of people, and the people that were given more freedom were the ones in Africa, and those those individuals had a rebellious gene that was allowed to to thrive in in those populations, and those were where they could think for themselves. So that's why I named my book Rebel Gene, uh, because I believe, you know, since I was a little kid, I talked back to teachers. I never did, you know, just what I was told just by because they said it. You know, I never believed somebody in authority. I never believed doctors or any of these people, um, you know, w knew what they were talking about. I just questioned everything and I still do. <laughs> and so that's what my title is all about. I, I have definitely been the same way throughout my life and I am so excited to read your book. Um, I actually, I, I read a book on by Garrett John Laporto called The Waste Years and he talks about this being a, a morph DNA gene that these certain personality types that tend to have ADD, ADHD, sometimes bipolar disorders, 
they tend to be like very pioneering artistic personality types. And he talked about actually being a morph DNA gene. Um, have you, do you talk about it? Be, like, is it like a morph DNA gene or would you just say it's like an evolutionary thing or um, is this well, just- I believe, that we, I believe that our DNA uh, is, is, is basically, you know what they say, we had junk DNA and all of that, that was a lie. So our DNA is, can be um, activated. And so it's not like if you don't show a rebel gene or a side of your personality up to a certain age or whatever, that you just don't have those genes. It's actually that it's just a dormant gene and it can be activated. So um, as far as I'm concerned, DNA is, can be changed and we can change it, okay? So we can generate what's called scalar waves um, through meditation. You know, it's the spin, it's about the spin and uh, basically change our DNA. And we're also being changed by what the kind of a waves that are hitting the planet at this time and on top of it, uh, scalar waves. And, and what's happening is that there is sort of a war for our bodies and our DNA right now on planet Earth. And they're trying to take us over to get rid of this. You know, you could say that in many ways, the, the God, what people call the God gene and the rebel gene are the same. In other words, it has to be this gene that basically is all about being a creator. See, we are creators. God is a creator. And so that's what we have in common with God. But in order to create, you have to say, you know, you have to see what's not there and imagine it. You have to create the new, you have to innovate. So all of that is an act of rebellion. If you, you know, if you never think along those lines, then you just follow, do what you're told and you don't innovate or change anything. You know, in my world, I worked in Hollywood for 20 years. I was always saying to people, why are you doing it like that? Why don't you try a different way? And, you know, it's, it's just interesting corporations. Uh, many people who work in corporations will know that many corporations are very slow to adopt change. So that's, that's kind of one of the signs of, of, following orders, you know, not being able to innovate, change, be fast on your feet, et cetera. You know, I feel that um, being a creator, when, it, when I was reading the, the inform, do my own research into the rebel gene, um, I really feel that it has a lot to do with tapping into the collective consciousness and just seeing the bigger picture. And, um, you know, I, 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 is that what you're kind of getting from it? It's just like kind of really tapping into this, like using more parts of your brain and really kind of seeing things from a bigger picture um, aspect. Well, yes, but it also has to do with uh, courage and, and the, the sort of the idea that, that we all come, we're all, um, as I say, we're humans are hybrid, a hybrid race. So we're a mixture of 12 and more DNA from various alien races. And some people appreciate that thought and some people don't, but that's basically the information I have. And from my perspective, if you come from another race of beings and you come to this planet in a human, you know, as part of this human experiment in a human body, then you bring with you your insights and, and the things that you learned also on those other planets. So it's also having the courage to change the world around you. So I don't think it's all, it's not necessarily simply seeing the bigger picture and, you know, here on earth necessarily, you know what I mean? I think it goes beyond earth and it's not limited by the collective com consciousness of earth because the whole reason for coming here, especially for many of us, is to change the collective consciousness of Earth because, and expand it and, you know, and, and do that in, in multiple ways that could even be shocking. So are these rebel gene uh, people basically bodhisattvas? Some. Are, uh, I would definitely say, but uh, I have to say, you know, a lot of the new children are, will have a rebel gene. I mean, children that are coming in that are rebellious and tend not to, you know, tend to do things their own way. It's also in terms of, 
you know, a lot of times when a child doesn't do things the way other children do, then they say there's something wrong with them. Now, I know the, the, the thinking has gradually become more enlightened, let's say, to where they're starting to realize that some of these children, especially when they have developmental issues, the reason they have them is because they're emphasizing a part of their personality and, and sort of um, self-actualization process is focusing on a completely different aspect of their beingness. And they're bringing that into the collective, again, bringing something from far away in. And as a result, they needed to block off certain things. Maybe they don't have great eyesight or they don't you know, socialize very well or whatever it has, happens to be. But on the other hand, their vision, what their inner vision is seeing is something else, some unique um, you know, gift that they bring to, to humanity as a whole. So I think more and more that has to be encouraged and developed because in a sense, you could see those as special visionaries that are bringing their gifts into humanity. You know, in, in my research, I, I read that um, actually people that have ADD or ADHD, a lot of times, it, uh, most children, they actually primarily think, or most people primarily think in beta brainwave state most of the time. And we all enter these different brainwave states throughout the day, but most kids, like when they're in school, like the way the classrooms are kind of made to, uh, they're kind of more geared towards uh, teaching children that think in primarily beta brainwave state, which is hyper-focused and kind of you know, learning things and being able to repeat them. Like when you take a test, it's like they would memorize all the stuff and then, you know, repeat it, be able to say it back and then, you know, finish their test and move on and not really remember it later or retain it very well. Whereas children that have, and people that have alpha theta brainwave state that primarily think in alpha theta brainwave state tend to um, kind of see things from a bigger picture, but they like learn differently. Like they're actually kind of more like slower with the way they do things. And they think more in like visions and kind of tap in a little more because they're actually using more of their brains at once, but only in like shorter spurts. Whereas um, children that are using primarily beta brainwave state, um, they use less of their brain, but um, but for more sustained amount of times. So like what in this book that I read, they were saying that people who have, mo that are primarily an alpha theta brainwave state back in ancient times, they would have been like the hunters, but now they're more like the artists because it's like they put every, or like the pioneer types or like athletic types because they put everything into what they're doing, but only in short amount of times. Like if you're like going on a hunt, like if you're hunting, it's like, if you're like the hunter from like your tribe, then like you're probably mostly resting most of the time. But when you go out and you're hunting, you're putting everything into it. And uh, I, I really think that I found that really fascinating. And they were saying that um, if you're thinking primarily on alpha theta brainwave state, you're actually kind of resonating with the Schumann resonance, like the, your, um, which is at eight hertz on, I thought that was really fascinating. Sure, I, I mean, there's a lot of different approaches uh, depending on what kind of a, you know, being it is. And so I think the, all of the approaches can be valid and, um, and should be encouraged. You know, I, I think that there's nothing again wrong with one way or another. It's simply a different way and Certainly, uh, some of them may come from, you know, um, experiences as, as a hunter having a, a having a need for being uh, having great concentration for short periods of time is can be very valuable, no doubt. But the opposite also applies. So. <laughs> Um, you know, they say, even say, you know, between males and females, like females can uh, can do many things at once very easily, whereas males tend to be more singular minded. Uh, so there's also there can be uh, I don't think it's it, it's necessarily going to be true of all this, you know, across the board. But there's like a various various uh, tendency in between male and female in that way that females can multitask easier. 
And I, you know, again, not better or worse, both, both are very good and both are very necessary to enduring, you know, survival. You know what I always like to say when, when people like a, a lot of men in the UFO kind of disclosure scene are always saying like, oh, the women need to come in and take over. And, you know, there's only it's like mostly run by men now. And but then they but then I hear these same people, they discredit women when they come forward because they say that, you know, women are more about channeling and, you know, the more the spiritual side of things. And it's like. But that's to me, I'm like, well, that's because women like their superpower, like the w female superpower is being intuitive. That's why, you know, your mother always knows everything. That's why your girlfriend always knows that if you're like cheating on her or something. And, you know, it's not that like men aren't intuitive, too. But I think that, um, you know, a lot more credit should be given to women that are coming forward in the disclosure community in regards to, you know, just kind of coming in from the aspect of being intuitive about things. And it's like, you know, it seems to me like a lot of the men in the disclosure community want to come through on the technical aspect of things like, oh, it's, you know, these kind of ships are coming out and, you know, they're like very kind of like tech, not everyone, you know, I'm not like generalizing everyone in it, but I'm just saying it, it tends to be that way to me. And then it's like the women that come forward with a more intuitive from a more intuitive uh perspective they tend to be overlooked because the scene is like more like run by men and they're discrediting it right but that's that's also true of of our our world in general so um and i think that that is changing i think you know as they say the goddess energy is is more and more taking control and and basically it's even said at this time that if we're going to get out of the situation we're in it's going to be the women that that save us in essence and it's interesting because a lot of the frontline doctors a lot of the doctors coming out are women if you know if you're paying attention so they're telling the truth you know they're coming out in their way and telling the truth and um i think that that's really where it's at i think uh i think in in many ways the women are the leaders of our times and i think that the men need to sort of sit back and realize that. But I also realize that, unfortunately, male energy has also been denigrated, like in, you know, by the certain movements. Uh, again, I don't want to get into that whole thing, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I don't think, I don't think that's a good thing either. I think that, again, you know, both should be revered, both should be understood to be, you know, wonderful and powerful and necessary. It's just that, Unfortunately, um, I see this all the time. I see that the, you know, the intuitives, the psychics, the remote viewers, you know, you name it, are actually being cast aside, even in the in the Republican so-called, um, you know, uh, truther movement, because those a lot of those men are so driven and what they're listening to, it even said behind the scene, they're listening to Project Looking Glass. They're, they're, looking, they're listening to the AI. And the AI is a technical, you know, again, it's right brain versus left brain, whereas they're not listening to the humans. You see, they're not listening to the human intuitives that actually could be much wiser than an AI, but people don't, it's all about science you know, and, and the science in the very male sense of that word. So, it, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's a focus, it's an approach, and it's, it's where our earth has an, an imbalance. There's no doubt about it between the male and the female energies. And so this shift is happening now. And I think more and more those among us that emphasize the psychic intuitive, uh, what you call right brain aspects of ourselves are going to be the ones that are proven right as time goes on, okay? Because it's not all about, um, you know, how big your gun is and, and, and the technology. Tech, as far as I'm concerned, technology is, is a crutch. It's, it's actually not necessary. When we actually develop fully as beings and come into our own as human beings here on planet Earth, we will do miraculous things and we won't need technology to do those things. It's, it's not to say to get rid of technology, but technology has to be understood for its own limitations. 
and understanding that what we are capable of has not been fully revealed on this planet. And I could tell you things that we're capable of that you won't be aware of, okay? That involve things like, um, you know, a super soldier and a bunch of children that were brought into Cambodia who linked hands and basically killed an entire village just in the, you know, by using scalar wave, waves and energy. So, you know, this is what we're talking about. The greatest weapon, the greatest secret is who we really are, who humans really are. You know, it's really fascinating because I, I've noticed that in a lot of new TV shows and movies in the entertainment industry, this is a very common theme lately. It's like humans tapping into certain superpowers and uh, yep. I think there's a there's a reason for that. It's almost sure. like they're trying to wake people up to this in a way. But also, you know, and also I want to say earlier, the the rise of the divine feminine is definitely happening. And, you know, I think that's what coming into the age of Aquarius means. And y y we can definitely feel it. And the difference to me between the divine feminine and, and the divine masculine, like what it means to be in a matriarchal society or matriarchal society compared to patriarchal is being in touch with a, like your own true connection with the divine instead of there being like kind of a liaison between that. And I, you can definitely see a shift with that, with the way people are with, um, you know, the way people are looking at religion and science and everything nowadays. And I've noticed that um, to, to me, I feel like, you know, religion used to be kind of like a control thing that, you know, was probably really started by the Anunnaki, but eventually it moved into science being the control method where it's like, listen to these scientists, this is what the truth is, don't question it. And that's what we're seeing like to the extreme this year. Right, that's exactly right. Well, they can see that um, the scientists have led them wrong, led everyone down the wrong path. And so it's, uh, the people that will survive and uh, thrive in the future will definitely have to have uh, way beyond six senses fully activated. And, you know, even just to save your own life, you're going to have to be highly intuitive, uh, able to predict the future, be a precog, you know, all the things that humans can do, but haven't actualized. Uh, very many of us haven't actualized those things. And it's growing more and more. I see it all around me. I see people becoming more psychic, more intuitive, tapping into things ahead of time, you know, knowing what's going to happen before it does, that kind of thing. Definitely. Um, I actually just read a book recently. It was... Um, the the third or the fourth book in the hundred thousand kingdoms series by nk jamison and it was kind of along this theme as well but it, it was interesting because at it in the very final book in the series like the series is about basically like these gods like coming and living on earth and then there's like these godlings that are like half human uh or they're like you know like these like lesser gods and then there's like these half human half gods but they're like really it looks down upon but um eventually like they start saying it in the third book in the series that um gods and goddesses are gonna like at some point people are gonna start like normal like ordinary humans are gonna start becoming gods and goddesses and in the very last book in the series they all actually at one point people just start spontaneously being born as like gods and goddesses and it's just like a spontaneous thing that kind of happens all at once and i thought it was really fascinating because right after that there was like a weird synchronicity where uh i was having a conversation with someone we were talking about evolution and you know they were a very come from a very like liberal like scientific background and i was telling them i was like you know like some some parts of evolution don't make sense to me i feel that um that basically it, it's like you know maybe like evolution does happen in the way that it does in darwinism but i also feel like you know like the human race and like different animals may have been seeded at different times throughout history and like maybe like you know our dna and the dna of different like animals and plants and things on our planet has been manipulated and they told me that he, he was like oh, i don't know about that but uh i've 
done a lot of research into the idea of um, spontaneous creation where, um, and, and this is like a proven thing supposedly scientifically that, um, that some two of the same animal can come together and create a, you know, offspring that is completely different than what they are. And it's like what they call like spontaneous creation. And I thought that was really fascinating. Sounds interesting. Sorry, that was a weird tangent. I don't really know where that came from. I don't remember um, what we were talking about. You know, I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, I, I like hearing about these ideas. I think, you know, um, I don't know, have you ever seen this video that says there are no trees on earth and it's all about how the earth has been terraformed and that there used to be the real trees were gigantic and that now there's just bushes basically by their standards. Like the double tower? There's a wonderful video about this. Oh, I, I've looked into that with the, the devil's tower and like certain places like that. Yeah, it's the like being the like tiny tower ages. is an example of that. It's a, the base of a tree according to this philosophy. And it's there's a video about it. It's a wonderful video. There's actually more than one type of these videos out there. And it just goes all around the earth and looks at all, everything on the earth and shows how it could be seen from a completely different point of view where when there were giants on the earth and all of that. And um, it's perfectly you know, believable. So as far as I can tell, um, that's exactly what's happening. I mean, we're always, we're also always being invaded. We're always being, um, you know, surveyed by various ET off planet races, inner earth races off, you know, um, interdimensional races, whatever, and that we are also exposed to different beings, different kinds of beings. And I, I guess my answer to that is simply why would you limit the imagination of the creator, you know, whatever you want to call God or source or whatever. It's just like that imagination is going to be endless. And so the, the types of beings that that beingness wants to create could be endless as well. Amazing. Um, so we've been on for about an hour now. I, I don't know if you, you know, wanted to keep going. Did you want to wrap this up? Um, um, well, I, I can't, I can go for a little bit longer if you wanted to do questions from the chat or something, it's up to you, but, um, yeah, I can't, I don't want to go on to, you know, that long, but, I can go for another 15, 20 minutes if you like. Okay, so great. Um, would so anyone if it, if anyone has any questions for Carrie, please put it in the uh, chat here. But I I've really enjoyed this interview. It's been really fun, and I would definitely like to meet with you again. We stay on after the show because there's some crazy things I want to tell you <laughs> that All I can't right. talk to you about on here. So. Cool. Um, so while, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I just want to let everyone know here before we wrap this up that um, I will be at doing an event up in Cambria, California, a little later, uh, for the 4th of July weekend, the 3rd and 4th. And I will be speaking at the United We Stand Fest which is put on by the Free and Equal Elections Committee. And what they're doing is basically trying to get rid of the two-party system where every party can run on an equal platform. So it's a really cool organization, and I'm excited to be speaking for them for the first time. I'm normally just performing for them. Um, so this is the whole speaker list here, and I believe tickets are sold out, but we do have the uh, live stream will be available. So you can sign up for it on here. And my presentation is... I am only allowed to give a 15 pre minute presentation, so I'm not sure how that's gonna work out, but <laughs> we'll see. Like my, my presentation is on solutions for humanity, so I don't, I, I guess I'm just gonna have to give a minute for each solution and we'll see how that works. <laughs> wow, yeah, okay, cool. So, uh, oh, um, let me see here, questions. Leon the Wise says, talk about synergy. Well, that's um, not really a question. That's kind of general. Okay, yeah, that's not a question. <laughs> I'm not sure, you know, what in uh, what respect. Everything, you know, I mean, you could say everything is simultaneous. And so synergy is like a natural outcome of that. 
Oh, uh, you're a living god, sis. Have you seen a ship before, Carrie? Oh, yeah, I've seen lots of UFOs. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, ever since I was a kid, I mean, we went, I've used, I've told people this before, but my family went camping in Lake Tahoe and we, we were putting out our sleeping bags. It was night and um, getting dark. And we all looked up at the sky, you know, laying on our backs in our sleeping bags. And then all the stars started to move and the whole sky was full of just moving stars and they were all going, coming and going different ways. So that was like a whole meeting we decided, or I decided that it was just a meeting of various, they had a meeting that night of various, you know, UFOs and races. So um, that is just one, you know, I have actually on my channel, I put, some of my sightings, I saw one in, um, on a, in a French town on the border of Lake Geneva. I saw a craft coming down over the, the city um, really late at night, like at two in the morning when in Europe, people are up in the summertime, they're out on the streets at two in the morning, it's just very normal. And um, so it's almost like daytime out there, but I had just been um, sort of, I think I had slept a little and then I woke up and I went outside, something drew me to go outside and people were going by and such. And I started looking up and I realized that there was a craft and it was coming down the street towards me. And uh, it was like a triangular, like more like a pie shaped craft. And, uh, and then later I found out that that's a very common occurrence in the Lake Geneva area, that there's a lot of people see the pie shaped uh, UFOs in that area. You mean like a pie slice? Yeah, like, yeah, there, it's called pie shaped, you know, it's it, it's shaped, you know, it's triangular, but it's fat, you know, and, and it's like a, a oh. slice of a pie kind of thing in it. It's at the you know, I had an interesting experience with that one time. I was driving through Tennessee <laughs> and I saw one come down low around a building and it was triangular and black and like very like thin. And I was actually on my way to like a youth group, like church camp, and I was in a bus full of, you know, other kids. And I looked at it, I swear, I just, I saw it was like very low, like coming around this building. And I told everyone, I was like, hey, look at this. And they're like, what are you talking about? I don't see anything. I'm like, how do you not see this? It was really strange because I, I know I saw it was like, I saw it very clearly. It was really interesting. Right. I mean, it's, it. I don't think it's a big deal. I've seen so many UFOs. I mean, just going in my backyard at night, being up in this Sierra Nevada because the sky is crystal clear and you can see UFOs. You can just sit and wait for them. You'll see them crossing the sky. It's just really obvious. Yeah. So, I mean, there's just so many. Um, I think anybody can see them if they just um, spend time maybe at night, especially it's great in the summer when it's warm, just to spend, you know, sit outside and just look for them, just watch. Uh, Ocean Odell says, hi, Carrie, can you talk about the Galactic Federation, the races involved and their mission? Uh, well, that's a pretty tall order. Um, I can say that uh, the Galactic Federation is a federation of many races that some have been taken over and have gone to the dark side. Uh, they've made deals, they've made um, treaties, they've broken them. So I, I am... Uh, you know, careful of anyone who is, is necessarily coming forward from the so-called Galactic Federation. Uh, but I can say that my information mainly comes from, um, you know, my own intuition and my dealings with the guardian races that are a, a certain group of races that are said to be guardians over humanity. And those are the ones that downloaded the information for the Voyager books by Ashiana Dean, who I interviewed for like six hours or something. And those interviews are available free on my, on the Odyssey channel. And um, the, the books are actually on the front page of Project Camelot. So you just go to projectcamelotportal.com, projectcamelot.org or projectcamelot.tv. And if you scroll down on the right hand side, you'll see my book, Rebel Gene. And underneath that are um, two books by Ashiana Dean, and those are downloads from the Guardian races, and they do out they do answer that question that you're asking me. But it goes on for you know pages and pages about the different races, um, you know what their sort of uh, 
alliances are, the, the wars in space that they've had and so on. So yeah, you've got this website, my website. So if you scroll down a little further, just scroll down on the front page, kind of keep going, keep going. There's Rebel Jean and there's Dashiana Dean. They're blue, see those books? Back, 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 stop, right there. See, there's two, you can click on them and buy it and buy it there. One of them is uh, available in a PDF. I'm not sure if they're both PDFs at this point. One of them used to be hard to find, Voyager one went out of print and so it became very expensive. And by the way, the Robert Tesk books underneath that are very good as well. But uh, yeah, that's, that's the first one. That's the one that's out of print, uh, but I think it might be now available to as PDF. And then the Voyager 2 is definitely there. And I mean, she they go to into such detail more than the Bible, more than any other, you know, law of one, you name it. They they really talk about the various kinds of beings and races and how they interact with each other and what's been going on. Thank you for that. We're getting a ton of questions in here. I know you probably don't want to answer all of these, so maybe I'll give you a, I threw this one up on the screen here. Uh, Carrie, have you ever tried past life regression hypnosis? You being the center of disclosure movement, one must question if you could possibly be a star seed. Well, I'd say I'm probably, if you want to call it a star seed, I definitely consider myself um, not common for my age group, if you want to say that. I'm very unusual. Um, I have certain things that I came in with, abilities, knowledge, etc. that most people I was grew up around, nobody even knew and all this kind of stuff. Um, as far as being regressed, yes, I have been regressed. I was uh, actually, I moved to LA when I was um, just out of college and came down here to work in Hollywood because I wanted to make movies like uh, Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind to reveal the information that I knew. And uh, so one of the, this woman regressed me and she, um, and, and what I came up in the re regression is kind of funny because I just said this on a, on a interview the other day on with John, John Claude. Uh, and I talked about my being regressed to the time in England when I was imprisoned as, as a witch, um, you know, and, and around the time of Arthur. I don't know if it was more than one life in that time, but I had a memory of that. And that's what came up in the regression was that, so. Oh, that's really amazing. The Mist of Avalon is my favorite series of all time. So yeah, I, I love the story of King Arthur. Yeah, so do I, so. Um, okay, well, I can take maybe one more question or, okay. and, you know, or not or whatever. Yeah, I definitely want to talk to you about something off air. So let me um, put one more up here. Let's see here. Favorite interview on Camelot by Darren Ryan. Uh, you know, I don't have a favorite. I, I love every one that I do whenever I'm doing it. You know, it's kind of like that. I, it's so fascinating. I think talking to people, it's a gift that I've been given that I never even imagined would happen. And, you know, I have ones that, you know, inner the people where sometimes the people I formed a lifelong bond with, if you will, that became, you know, friends of mine, or I consider to be mentors in a certain way. Um, and, and, you know, and there's lots of them. I mean, Bob Dean is one of my favorite interviews, interviewees, because he's such a lovable man. And I had a very close kind of father daughter relationship with him. Um, but you know, there, there have been lots of uh, fabulous people that I've interviewed that are just, you know, incredible. Miriam Delicato, some people may remember my interviews with her. She's a fabulous woman. We're still friends to this day. Um, you know, so I, I like to become friends with people that I, you know, that resonate with me. Um, some of my whistleblowers have died, you know, like Gordon Novell, and we became good friends. Uh, you know, I think I talked to him the night before he died or very close to it. 
Uh, so yeah, um, I guess those are some. Awesome. Well, it was so great to have you on here and, you know, I'm, I'm sure all the audience and myself, everyone here tonight really appreciates all the work you've done with Project Camelot over the years. So thank you so much for coming on. Is there any final words you would like to give everyone before I end the show tonight? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I, I, I think just uh, try to be, if, you know, if this is your inclination is to go forward with um, courage and, and sort of be the change you want to see type of thing rather than, uh, you know, because we're in a, sit a very judgmental time when a lot of the people around us can't necessarily keep up. And it, it takes, you know, it takes a real um, sort of depth of knowledge and understanding to give other people the space to take as long as they need to come to self-realization and see the truth instead of trying to force it on them or get angry because they don't see it. And I'm not saying it's easy. I've had to deal with a lot of anger during these, these times for the past year and a half that I was surprised I was, you know, would get angry, but I did, you know, and I had to face that. That was like so amazing that, you know, I've had to face, it's not even, you know, cause I was used to being angry at, the powers that be, but I wasn't used to being angry at my fellow citizens for being, you know, so stupid or slow, you know, to understand and, and see, you know, have insight and, and all of that. So I think that takes a great, you know, that's a great teaching, a great learning. And, um, and so I encourage people to go down that road. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks so much for being here. And thanks everyone for joining on my show tonight. I think this is the most live concurrent viewers I have had so far. So that's <laughs> very exciting. Apparently a lot of people like you, Carrie. <laughs> um, so again, please check out my Shaman Spear side if you want to help fund my show. That's at the bottom here, the Odyssey collection. I have an amazing new collection of spears. I also have my new I Believe in Human t-shirts up on the site. So please go ahead and check that out. And I, and to all anyone who's on the show tonight that hasn't been watching, I go live pretty much every Tuesday and Thursday. I will not be going live this Thursday, though, because I will be traveling. But please tune in for the next Tuesday. And also, like I said earlier, please go check out the Free and Equal Elections website. And if you would like to check out the event on the 3rd and 4th, uh, the live stream tickets are available. So until next time on Apollo's Odyssey, thanks everyone for being here over and out. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie.